this mathematics, the natural sciences, and the human sciences are uh, forms of what we may call academic knowledge. You remember this one. Um, and in contrast to other forms of knowledge, including religious knowledge and common sense knowledge. So we are going to contrast academic knowledge and common sense knowledge. So to give you some examples of the different kinds of knowledges, uh, you find the statement in the Bible, Jesus is a son of God, but that is part of religious knowledge in the Christian tradition. Uh, and the statement that Jesus was a prophet, not the son of God, is part of the religious knowledge of the Islamic tradition. These are two conflicting, uh, these are two conflicting uh, propositions. These two are not part of academic knowledge. Um, to take another example, we all know from experience that stubbing one's toe is more painful than a pinch on one's finger. You don't learn this in school or college or in a textbook, you learn this from experience. Um, similar statement about the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. This is our experience, uh, but that doesn't mean that you know, the sun moves around the earth. Academic knowledge tells us that, that the uh, earth revolves around the sun, that the, the, the illusion of the sun moving, uh, that is not true. Okay, so such statements are part of common sense knowledge, partly experiential, partly coming from what others have told us and so on. So the question that we want to address today is, what exactly are the differences between those two? so that we might be able to investigate elements of uh, common sense knowledge in academic disciplines. So what we are going to do is to explore the norms of academic knowledge. And remember when we say academic knowledge, it includes mathematics, physics, biology, chemistry, sociology, uh, philosophy, literary studies, all of those, those things which are taught in universities. And we compare them with the attributes of common sense knowledge. And the point I'm going to make is that some of the attributes of common sense knowledge creep into academic knowledge. And so the academic, different fields of academic knowledge are not completely pure. Some of the norms are not necessarily observed. That's the point I want to make in this talk. Um, so there is, a, there is a gap between the norms and the actual practice. The norms as I, formulate them, that is. All right, so this is, this is going to be the structure of the talk. In the first part, I will go through various concepts of knowledge. In the second part, we'll go through the norms of uh, normative axioms of academic knowledge. In the third part, we'll contrast those with the characteristics of common sense knowledge. And in the fourth part, um, we will look at the elements of common sense knowledge in academic fields, the practical affairs. All right, so let's go to the first part, common sense knowledge, sorry, concepts of knowledge. Uh, we begin by noting that the, the English verb know has two meanings. Um, one of them we say, when you say Zeno knows that bicycles have two wheels, but motor cars have four, we're talking about a piece of information. We are also saying that the statement that bicycles have two wheels and motor cars have four, that statement, that proposition is true. That is, we believe that statement to be true. So this is know that form of knowledge, uh, which is a belief. Another kind of knowledge is illustrated by Zeno knows how to drive a car, but he has not learned how to ride a bicycle. Now here, what Zeno knows is actually an ability. It's as good as saying, the first one is information and belief. The second one is ability or skill. So we call this know how to. So the two kinds of knowledge that I'm talking about is know that form of knowledge and know how to form of knowledge. And in this talk, I'm concerned with the first type, the knowledge of know, know that type, which is about truth of propositions. Right. 
All right, now, um, one of the characteristics of common sense knowledge in the English, embedded in the English verb know, are two important aspects, important properties. It's important to understand that. One of them is total certainty, and the other is egocentrism. Let me explain what I mean by that. If I say, I know that the train comes at 10, I cannot say, but I'm wrong. Why? Because the verb know, whatever follows that must be absolutely true. We can't, it cannot be wrong. I cannot say, but I might be wrong. Also, that is impossible. So this is total certainty. Egocentrism is illustrated by in sentences like, Zeno knows that the train comes at 10 o'clock, but Zeno is wrong. Why is that odd? Because the English verb no requires that when I use the, the clause that follows it, I should believe it. Otherwise, I cannot say that. So for example, you can't say, Zeno knows that the train comes at 10 o'clock, but I know that the train comes at 12. That's not possible. Because when you say, <clears throat> essentially, when you say Zeno knows something, what it means is that Zeno believes what I believe to be true with absolute certainty. This is what I mean by egocentrism. It's a, you're talking about the speaker's belief projecting onto somebody else's belief. This is a very peculiar uh, characteristic of the verb know. And this is central to the common sense con concept of knowledge. And it pervades all over it, it. In fact, it comes to academic discussions even. So it's important to understand this. There's a slightly different concept of knowledge in philosophy textbooks, the introductory philosophy textbooks. The most common classical definition of knowledge in philosophy textbooks is that knowledge is justified true belief. The true belief is the same as in common sense knowledge. It conveys the same total certainty and also the egocentrism. But in addition to those two, the uh, idea of justified true belief uh, says that it is not sufficient to have belief, which is totally certain. It is not sufficient to have true belief. The, the belief must be justified. So you must know the reasons for the belief. So if you believe that the earth goes around the sun, but you don't know the evidence for it, you don't know the justification for it, then that doesn't qualify as knowledge. But of course, if you accept that position, uh, most of the things that are taught as knowledge in schools and colleges if you do not understand the justification, will not count as knowledge according to this definition. This is important, the concept of justification. In academia, if you look at it, if you look at the norms of uh, academic research, what you find is a very different picture. First of all, it, it must be rational. What that means is it must be justified and it must not carry logical contradictions, et cetera. It, sh it should be subject to reason. That is kind of implicit in the philosophical definition that uses justified, but not some, this part, namely it should be, it is uncertain and fallible. This, is, this con conflicts with the total certainty of common sense knowledge and the definition of true belief in philosophy. Uncertain, fallible, and defeasible. There are ways of showing that knowledge can be wrong. And this is somewhat interesting. This is the, this is the part that I'm going to pursue later. Um, and we also need to make a distinction between knowledge and information. If you say that bicycles have two wheels, it's just a piece of information. But when we say a body of knowledge, then it should go beyond information to a collection of propositions that are, connect, that are well connected, integrated, have a structure and so on. And also it should, it should contribute to our understanding. It should go beyond information to knowledge. All right. Um, another set of concepts that I want to uh, introduce are now inquiry and research. This is important for the discussion of academic knowledge. What do I mean by inquiry? Enquiry is the, has five components. It is the investigation of a question or a problem. Uh, and it should rely on our own experience and observation 
reasoning, thinking, and judgment. This is important because if you pick up some piece of information from, uh, if you go to an inquiry counter in a railway station or in an airport and ask, when is the flight arriving? And you get the answer that flight is arriving at such and such time. That is not inquiry, even though it is called inquiry counter, because you didn't use your own experience or observation to, or thinking to arrive at the answer. You simply got somebody else's answer. What that also implies is that if you get an answer from a book or a, a lecture, that is not inquiry. And essentially what that means is examination questions are not inquiry questions, because when you answer an examination question, the expectation is that before the, the question is asked, you already know the answer. You have gotten the answer from your lectures or textbooks, somewhere else, not through your inquiry. Uh, so we should rely on our own uh, experience, observation, reasoning, thinking, and judgment, and you look for an answer, you find an answer, and then a conclusion based on that answer. But that is not sufficient. You should also uh, critically evaluate it. Okay, so these are the components of inquiry. What's the relation between inquiry and research? It's very simple. The process is the same for both inquiry and research. So you could say research is the, um, is the process of inquiry that aims at um, contributing to academic knowledge. Okay, because the outcome of the process of inquiry is knowledge and research is inquiry that aims to make a contribution to collective knowledge. These are some of the basic concepts that we need in this conversation, in this talk. And what do we mean by rational inquiry? Rational inquiry is a form of inquiry that is subject to the norms of rationality, that subject to reasoning. And um, the outcome of rational inquiry, I will explain in a moment what the word rational means a little later but the outcome of rational inquiry is rational knowledge. That allows you to say that the uh, components of rational inquiry are questions whose answers we wish to find out, ways to look for answers which is methodology, uh, answers to questions and conclusions based on the answer. All these are uh, the same as uh, earlier case of uh, just inquiry. But here is the important part, rational justification that is that the conclusions that we arrive at must be rationally justified. They must approve or evidence arguments, et cetera, to support the conclusions. This is not part of common sense knowledge. This is not part of ordinary inquiry. This is a special condition for rational inquiry and hence academic inquiry. And more importantly, thinking critically about the conclusions and justification. Again, this is not part of common sense knowledge. Okay, so academic knowledge, uh, academic inquiry is the form of rational inquiry that goes into academic research. It's a form of collective inquiry, not individual inquiry. And the purpose is to contribute to academic knowledge. These are the ways in which the concepts that I have introduced are interconnected. Don't worry about the, I'm, I'm going through all this fairly quickly. Don't worry about it. At the end of this, uh, we will share with you the PowerPoint slides and uh, you can uh, look at them and reflect on them. Okay. Um, and academic knowledge is the outcome of collective rational inquiry. It's not just one person's work. It's a, it's a community of academics that construct academic knowledge, unlike personal knowledge, for example. All right. So that's the first part, but before uh, we go on to part two, the norms of norm, normative axioms of academic knowledge. I would pause and ask if there are any questions for clarification because I rushed through it, but only clarificatory questions. If you have questions, raise your hands and, uh, you know, uh, unmute yourself and show your video and ask. I'll wait for a little while for the questions. Okay, looks like uh, there are no questions. Uh, I'll again pause at the end of part three. If you have questions, do share the questions. So at the end of part two and part three. 
Okay, I want to discuss seven axioms of academic knowledge. This is where it becomes really, really important. One axiom, the central axiom is the prohibition of logical contradiction. I'll explain that in a moment. The second is accepting logical consequences. Third is conceptual clarification. Fourth is rational justification. Fifth, falsifiability. Uh, sixth, clarity of expression, clarity of thinking, clarity of expression, and finally, rigor. These are the central requirements of academic knowledge. What does that mean? Okay, so take the first one, prohibition of logical contradictions. What that set means is that combinations of propositions that are logically contradictory cannot be accepted as knowledge, cannot be accepted as true. What does it mean? What is, what is a logical contradiction? A logical contradiction is a set of two propositions, one of which denies the other. So if you, if you think the train will come at 10 o'clock and the train will not come at two o'clock, notice that one part of the sentence denies the other part. Okay, the train comes at 10 o'clock, the train doesn't come at 10 o'clock. The earth goes around the sun, the earth doesn't go around the sun. These are denials, mutual denials. That's such a situation is logical contradiction. And what this says is that you cannot accept logical contradictions in a body of academic knowledge. That's the very first. This is, a, this is an extremely important quality control. And we'll see that this quality control requirement is not always observed. Okay, this was first initially stated by uh, long ago by Aristotle. And if you violate this, if you believe at the same time that the train comes at 10 o'clock and the train doesn't come at 10 o'clock, you're being irrational. That's the very definition of irrationality. And it means academic knowledge should not be irrational. All right, we'll, we'll see examples of this later. The second one is also related to logic or reasoning. What it says is, uh, if you accept a set of premises, if you believe certain things, then we must also accept its logical consequences. So here's an example. Suppose you believe that John is taller than Bill, and you also believe that Bill is taller than Mary. Now, if you also believe that, the, so the logical consequence is John is taller than Mary, all right? Uh, John is taller than Bill, Bill is taller than Mary, therefore John is taller than Mary. If you now believe, so this is a logical consequence, if you believe the premises, you must also believe the conclusions from the premises. If you now believe that Mary is taller than John, there is a logical contradiction because taller than is, uh, if you say John is taller than Mary, uh, Mary is taller than John, there is a logical contradiction. One denies the other. So the, the, these two ideas, logical contradiction and logical consequence go together. In fact, logical consequence becomes necessary because in order to detect logical contradictions, you need to use logical consequences. So the primary consideration is logical contradiction. But that is not sufficient. Logical consequence is not sufficient. You also need conceptual clarification. Because if these statements are unclear, you don't know what the consequences are. So take an example, John is taller than Bill and Bill is taller than Mary. If I say something like, John is boobledy hawk than Mary, you don't know what boobledy hawk means. You cannot deduce the logical consequences, okay? If I say something like, uh, people who have vital spirit can learn better. You don't know what it predicts. You cannot deduce the logical consequences because you don't know what the word vital spirit means. So you have to clarify this, you have to define it and so on. This is an extremely important consideration in academic knowledge. Okay. If you use ordinary words with unclear meanings, you can't construct rigorous knowledge. The next is the requirement of rational justification. What it means is that if you want a claim, a knowledge claim to be accepted, you must justify it. Uh, this is most uh, tellingly illustrated in mathematics because mathematicians make a distinction between conjectures. Conjectures are knowledge claims. 
and theorems. Theorems are conjectures which have been proved to be true. So when a conjecture is proved to be true, we call it a theorem. So essentially what this is saying is that you must prove as theorems what you believe to be true. That's what rational justification means. You must provide proof, uh, argument, evidence, defense, support for your conclusions. This is a very important consideration in uh, academic knowledge. This is not true for, this is not the case in common sense knowledge. These are the central characteristics of academic knowledge. Now, sometimes when you say it predicts something, uh, you must also predict what it, uh, let me put it this way. A theory must be designed in such a way that it would spell out under what conditions, what circumstances we would reject it as false. So when you say X predicts Y, you should also say what is not possible, not simply what is possible, but what is not possible. So if you observe the things that it predicts are not possible, then the theory is false. Okay. That's what falsifiability means. Okay. A theory should say what kinds of things would make the theory false so that you can critically evaluate it. If you don't know how to prove that a theory is false, even in, uh, in imaginary circumstances, then the theory is not an academic theory. Okay, this will become clear when you take actual examples. So hold on for a second. You might be familiar with the name falsifiability, the word falsifiability, but not its actual application. Finally, it should be clear, it should be totally clear. Premises and conclusions are propositions. Sentences uh, express propositions. The proposition must be so clear that it is possible to deduce the logical consequences. So if you, if you use a sentence in academic knowledge, what it means is that you must be clear about the proposition that the sentence is expressing. And the other part is words in the sentences express concepts. And if you don't know what the concepts are, you don't know what the propositions are. So let's take an example. Suppose I uh, raise my ha right hand and say, I have exactly four fingers on my right hand. Is it true or false? Well, you might, some of you might say true, some of you might say false. If you define the word finger as all the digits on the human hand, then the statement that I have exactly four exactly means four and only four. That statement is then false. But if you define the word finger to mean all digits on the human hand, except the thumb, this is not a finger, then of course it is true that I have exactly four. So this is a very trivial case uh, that in order to evaluate the truth of a sentence, you must be clear about the proposition for which you must know the concept, you must define the concept. Uh, and you will see that this is an extremely important condition without definitions, without clear definitions, without clarifying the concepts and propositions, you cannot really check whether the a theory or a body of knowledge is true. You cannot deduce the logical consequences. All right. Uh, and finally, uh, academic knowledge must be rigorous. What that means is something like this. We know that absolute knowledge or absolute truth is unattainable because human knowledge is always uncertain and fallible. However, you must try our best to get there in that direction. We won't get there, but we'll move. We should move in that direction as much as possible. So do whatever we can to increase the probability of getting closer to truth. That's what rigor means. It also means do your best to reduce the possibility of error. All these are the commitments that we accept when we start functioning in academic knowledge, but not necessarily in other traditions of knowledge. This is what uh, research calls for. All right. Now, uh, before we go on to part three, let me again ask, are there any questions, any clarificatory questions? I have a question. Uh -huh. Clarification. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you had mentioned about um, one of the a falsifiability as being one of the 
norms of uh, academic knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, though you have mentioned in general for uh, uh, like academic knowledge as a whole, um, and you had uh, talked about uh, not um, theory is not predicting what we cannot observe, and like you, you shouldn't. Uh, uh, so, uh, but doesn't falsifiability uh, apply only to say scientific knowledge, the subset of academic knowledge, like, uh, or does falsifiability hold true even for uh, mathematical knowledge and philosophical? Knowledge? Yes, I will give you examples of that. Uh, what it means is that if you have a set of axioms and definitions in academic knowledge, and you, if you derive a theorem, under what conditions would you say the theorem is false? Under what conditions would you say the conjecture is false? And if you prove that conjecture as theorem, then if there is some, uh, some reason for believing that there is an opposite case, then the falsif- falsifiability condition applies to mathematics also. It doesn't mean that uh, mathematics, mathematical theories are shown to be false by comparing it with observation, but there is an internal reason. Okay, so si- what is characteristic of science is that falsi- falsifiability, looking for counterexamples, is looking for observational counterexamples. In mathematics, you don't look at observation, but there are still cases. The same thing applies to ethics and so on. Okay, so it's a much more general condition. Uh, I know that the term falsifiability that comes from Popper is typically used in the sense of observational falsifiability, but there are other ways of falsifying or showing that a theory is false by, for example, showing logical contradictions in the theory. Remember that I said that uh, if a theory contains logical contradictions, then the theory is false. So one way of showing that a, a theory is wrong is to demonstrate logical contradictions, inconsistencies, within the theory. That applies to mathematics, that applies to ethics, that applies to everything. Okay, the observational condition applies only to science. All right. Okay, so let's proceed. Um, now, to contrast the uh, norms of academic knowledge with common sense knowledge, I already mentioned total certainty of belief. In, in common sense knowledge, there is no uncertainty, there is no, there is no expectation that your, your knowledge could be false. But that is not the case in academic knowledge. There is another aspect of common sense knowledge that it typically exhibits blind trust in authority. This is maximally true in uh, religious, uh, uh, religious knowledge, knowledge based on some religious texts. Uh, it is also true in what we call dogma. Okay, dogma is uh, a case of blind trust in authority or blind trust in some, uh, some proposition. Uh, this, this is widespread outside of academia. Of course, it is also widespread in, uh, in um, some fields that are still taught as academic knowledge in universities and colleges and schools. Common sense knowledge also doesn't distinguish very carefully between, uh, the, between the, in the distinction between appearance and reality. For example, it appears to us, um, there is an arrow and an O, I'm not sure what it means. It just came up just now. Um, uh, a, appearance and reality, an example would be we all, believe that the sky is blue in common sense knowledge. And it doesn't occur to us that it is only an illusion, it's only an appearance, there is no such thing as sky. Academic knowledge, on the other hand, uh, is extremely sensitive to that, sensitive to illusion. So if you look at a mirror, even though there seems to be something behind the mirror, we know it is an illusion. But that, that distinction between appearance and reality doesn't extend to, for example, the, the perception of the sky, or the appearance that the moon is bigger than the stars, or uh, many other things. The, the sun appears to be moving towards the west in the morning. We don't pause and ask, could that be an illusion? The feeling that the earth is completely stationary, is that an il- illusion? The, none, of these questions, the, none of these questions of doubt exist in common sense knowledge. It also confuses uh, 
language and reality. So words give you concepts. And sometimes instead of saying the word could be ambiguous, we should distrust words, we should look at the concepts. And rather than look, saying that the sentence is false, we should be saying that the proposition expressed by the sentence is false. Quite often, uh, you can try this experiment. If you do this, what I said to you just now, I have exactly four fingers. I don't have five, uh, five fingers. I'm pretty sure that the person sitting next to you, next to you say, what, are you mad? Of course you have five fingers, not four. Why is that? Because they have one definition of the word finger and they don't pause and reflect, pause and think that, you know, there could be other definitions of the same word. That possibility that words could have multiple meanings and therefore the proposition that you express must be clearly articulated. That is not part of, uh, part of common sense knowledge. So it mixes up language and reality. Everything that is stated in language you take to be real, take to be true. This is a very confusing area of research. Another aspect of uh, um, common sense knowledge is that doubting, questioning, and critical thinking is absent in common sense knowledge, unlike in academic knowledge. Okay. You, you do not normally expect people who are not exposed to academic knowledge to doubt themselves, for example, their own beliefs, or the beliefs of the authorities, or the beliefs of their peers. Uh, common sense knowledge doesn't have doesn't use explicit definitions and laws. In fact, many academic fields also don't have that uh, tradition of formulating knowledge in terms of definitions, laws, and conclusions. This is characteristic of mathematics. It is characteristic of analytic philosophy, but not in many other. It is not a characteristic of many pursuits. To that extent, they deviate from the norms of academic knowledge. Uh, it also doesn't uh, subscribe to the idea of rational justification. Okay. So let's move on to part four. Uh, I'll wait for a few seconds to uh, see if there are questions. If there are no questions uh, now, we'll of course have questions at the end of the talk. Part four is the last section. Uh, there is a question in chat. It mm -hmm. says, doesn't axiom one assume an underlying logical system? Um, I'm not sure what axiom one here means because this came up a bit earlier. Yeah, axiom one, I think is the, uh, the logical contradiction. Logical okay. contradictions are uh, prohibited. Uh, it doesn't actually, it's the other way around. If you want to check logical contradictions, then you must have axiom two, logical consequence, because sometimes contradiction is not between two propositions themselves, but their logical consequences are logically contradictory. So yes, there is a relation between axiom one and axiom two. In fact, that's why I said that axiom one is the most important part, the primary thing. The rest simply are you know, consequences of accepting that axiom. Uh, the, the requirement of clarity, all those things are also part of that because if, you, if your propositions are not expressed in clear words, obviously you cannot check the logical consequences. So, uh, so rejection of logical consequences is fundamental to academic knowledge, but not always observed. Um, there's another question in the chat. Uh -huh. So Sriram asks, you had mentioned research being different from inquiry. Can you give an example to get clarity on that distinction? Okay, suppose I want to investigate the question uh, whether my father, my father died several years ago, whether my father was an ethical person. I can engage an inquiry on the basis of my memory of my father, what he has written and reports of uh, his life and so on. But that doesn't constitute research because it is not a public interest. I am doing that inquiry on something that is of interest to me, but it is not part of the collective knowledge. So it is not, it is not research. Research is something that make, intends to make a contribution to the collective pool of academic knowledge. This is not part of public knowledge. I can also ask the question, am I an ethical person? 
Okay, that question is not of interest to anybody else, but I will be engaged in, engaging an inquiry into that question, which will not be research. Um, so uh, all research is inquiry, but the reverse is not true. Sorry, can I interrupt for a moment? Uh -huh. uh, the distinction that you made is between personal knowledge and collective knowledge. Yes. Um, for inquiry, if, a, if an eighth grader wants to find out something that is there in published literature, but he doesn't or he or she doesn't know it, that would still be inquiry because it's not part of, uh, it's not contributing to the collective pool. Yes. So inquiry can happen even, uh, even, when, even when the knowledge is already available if yeah. you're finding it out for yourself. Yes, absolutely. So school children are capable of inquiry, but they're not capable of research as yet because they are not familiar with the, the up-to-date body of knowledge. If you want to make a contribution to research, then you must go beyond what is currently available, but you can still engage in inquiry. Okay. Uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, would uh, prefer, uh, I would prefer you to call me not sir, but either Mo or Mohanan. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to ask that, uh, does research, the term research, uh, I mean, uh, is it a convention to always uh, use the term research only when it is for a collective purpose, it has a collective purpose in mind? Like, uh, I mean, it, it contributes to the society. Does research have to contribute to the society? That's what my question uh, is. I didn't say contribute to society. I said, uh, collective pool of knowledge. Uh, so for example, you might do research on the size of the universe. I don't know in what way it contributes to society in the ordinary sense. Or you might do research on the age of the universe. It's not a useful, uh, out the, the outcome is not going to be of any use to society. So it's a, the, the, the knowledge of the size of the universe and age of the universe are part of the collective pool of knowledge of humanity. And research must make a contribution to that in some, some sense. If it is only of personal benefit, personal knowledge, or if it is something that is already, as Tara pointed out, something that is already known, that is not research. Okay, right? okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so if you compare the two, what makes common sense knowledge unique? Uh, sorry, what makes academic knowledge unique? I'll, I'll pick on two things. One is, the methodological tools for looking for and eliminating logical contradictions. I already said that this prohibition of logical contradiction is central to academic knowledge. And the ways of looking for logical contradictions to eliminate them is central. The other is a deep awareness of the uncertainty and fallibility of human knowledge, as opposed to total certainty. These are the two most important parts of academic knowledge that makes it unique, different from all other systems of knowledge. So let's take a look, okay? And the other kind of consequences of ac accepting logical consequences, doubting and questioning, self-correction, testing predictions, explicitness, all these things that I mentioned are simply consequences of these two pillars of the central characteristics of uh, norms of academic knowledge. Okay, so let's, let's now, I have been talking in, the, in a very abstract level all this time. Let's take actual examples now. Uh, let's ask the question, can triangles have straight angles? Okay, so here is a definition of straight angle. Given line segment AB and a point C, any point C on the line segment, ACB is a straight angle. All right, pause for a moment. Okay, this is the textbook stuff. I mean, just about every uh, school textbook, mathematics, I don't know eighth grade or something like that. They give you this definition of straight angle, right angle, obtuse angle, and so on. So if you draw a straight line AB and put any point on it, put any point C on it, then ACB is a straight angle, 180 degrees. Okay, and you don't think there is anything funny about it, but let's see. The angle sum theorem also says this, you can prove this, the sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees or two right angles. Okay, now a triangle has, you see, if you have A, B, C, there is angle B, angle A, and angle C, 
the sum together constitutes 180 degrees. But if you now have every straight line, you know that has infinitely many points on it. And each point is a straight angle. So every straight line has infinitely many straight angles. If you add up the answer to the question, that what is the sum of uh, angles in a straight angle would be infinitely many. It is not going to be 180. So there is an obvious logical contradiction. Right? This is not something that you may have thought about unless you have seen this. Uh, there is a problem here. So it shows that the combination of this theorem, angle sum theorem, and the definition of straight angle will give you a logical contradiction. Therefore, the theory is false. This is what I meant by falsif falsifying even mathematical theories. So we must do something about it. OK? I have just used the, the two tools, looking for logical contradictions and uh, deducing logical consequences. You put them together. You find a logical contradiction. The theory is bad. The prediction, that is the logical consequence from the definition that uh, you know, every straight line has infinitely many straight angles, that leads to a problem. It leads to a logical contradiction. Of course, I'm not saying that there, there is no way out, but I'm not going to uh, give you the solution uh, because if I give you the solution, the learning will stop. So I leave the solution to you. I know it will agonize some of you at least. And that agony is a good thing. Okay, so this is the this is the way of using logical contradiction as a as a driving tool through for every branch of knowledge, academic knowledge. So here is a here is a nice clean example of that norm in academia. Okay, let me take another example. Uh, this has to do with the, the concept of democracy. We are moving from mathematics to politics. And you ask the question, is there democracy in the United States? Well, the answer depends upon how you define democracy. Okay. Uh, here are two possible definitions. One, democracy is a political system in which the citizen, citizens of a country elect their rulers through voting. Okay, if that is a definition you ask, does the United States have uh, a democracy? Yes. Uh, because they have the system of uh, voting to elect their rulers, if that is a definition. But let's ask, let, us, let us have a different definition. This is the definition that many people accept. Democracy, uh, democracy is a political system in which the citizens of a country who are affected by a decision have an opportunity to influence that decision. All right? That's a different definition. It just says nothing about election, says nothing about voting. Now you ask the question, is there democracy in the United States? According to definition two, many would say, no, there isn't. Because the people who do the voting, the citizens have no uh, opportunity to influence the decisions. Their decisions are made by the, the rulers, not by the citizens. Citizens can only vote. And that's not democracy according to definition two. Notice that once you precisely define something, you can see the problems in a body of knowledge. And uh, definitions, are the, the use of such definitions is not a characteristic of many disciplines. Unlike in mathematics, uh, this is not uh, a characteristic in, for example, in history or political science or sociology, and many other disciplines for that matter. So here is an instance, not defining things clearly is a characteristic of common sense knowledge. So what I have just demonstrated is a case of existence of elements of common sense knowledge in what is generally regarded as academic knowledge. Okay, so I've gone through this. I, uh, let's take another one, let's go to biology. The, the definition of species that all of you have learned is Ernest Meyer's definition. Uh, the concept of biological species. And it says that uh, two varieties uh, belong to the same species if and only if they have the potential to mate 
and produce an uh, produce a viable uh, a fertile offspring. That's the Myers definition, right? Let me repeat that definition. Two varieties belong to the same species if and only if they have the potential to mate and to produce a fertile offspring. That means if two, two varieties belong to two distinct species, it predicts they cannot mate to produce an offspring, uh, a fertile offspring, right? Two varieties that belong to two distinct species, the individuals cannot mate to produce a viable offspring. Hold that thought. Now, what is a hybrid species? The, the concept of hybrid species was well known to Darwin. Okay, it is, it, just look it up in Wikipedia, you'll find lots and lots of examples of hybrid species. What's a hybrid species? A hybrid species is a result of mating between two distinct species. They have mated and they have produced uh, fertile offspring and they have continued over a long time. That's how the hybrid species have evolved to be. How then these two, how do these two things now, uh, how do you compare them? One says, if two varieties belong to two distinct species, they cannot mate to produce a viable offspring. And the other says, there exist, there exist species resulting from the reproduction from two distinct species. There is a logical contradiction. If this doesn't worry you, if this logical contradiction doesn't worry you, you're outside the space of academia. But does it really worry you is a question. And I can give you lots and lots of examples of this kind in just about every field. What that means is that academic, what is taught as academic knowledge in textbooks and classes are quite often impure, impure in the sense people are not sufficiently rigorous to detect these problems. And common sense ideas come in, you don't challenge it, you don't look for possible mistakes, you don't define things, you don't prove things. So there is a huge gap between the norms and the actual practice. It's like traffic laws versus you know, actual practice of driving. This is a point that I wanted to make. Okay, then my last example is natural selection. Um, ah, um, okay, I was hoping to finish in, in uh, 40 minutes, but we started a little late, I guess. Uh, natural selection, according to Darwin, I'm using Darwin's definition, is a principle by which each slight variation of a trait, if useful, is preserved. That's a causal mechanism for speciation in uh, Darwin's evolutionary theory. Okay, now take a very careful look. Um, is it talking about elimination or extinction? It could be interpreted in two different ways. Okay, so survival of the fittest, for example, says that uh, the fit are selected or the unfit are eliminated. Two ways of doing it. The fittest, the, uh, the, if you rank fitness, the top range is selected or the bottom range, those that do not cross the threshold is eliminated. So it, is it natural selection or natural elimination? You get completely different predictions from that. Selecting from the top, survival of the fittest. Incidentally, natural selection and survival, survival of the fittest are the same thing. You know, they, they, it's the same causal mechanism. Darwin simply changed the wording because he was influenced by some of his friends. They have very different predictions. If you are not careful, it is very difficult to evaluate the theory. And there are many other things of this kind, which I will not go into now because there are way too many. Okay, so I'm just pointing to uh, a problem in the, the idea of natural selection, which is the same as for survival of the fitness. You also have to define what you mean by fitness. Is it a matter of adaptive fitness? That is the, the, the function and the structure, the function and behavior of an organism must fit the environment, the habitat. But that's not how it is actually taken. It is simply a counting of the number of offspring. Okay, uh, I, will, I will skip this one, the Panchamahabhuta um, 
as a common sense theory of the ancient sciences of life because to, to, to elucidate that, it'll take me some time. So I'm going to skip that. But this, the essential idea is asking the question, what does a theory predict to not exist? But this question is also equally important for evolutionary theory. What, do, what does Darwin's theory predict to not exist? How will I show that the theory is false? That's not clear. And to the extent that it is not clear, Darwin's theory of evolution is at best a common sense theory, not an academic theory. I'm not saying it is false. I'm saying insufficient rigor. The theory has not been properly developed into a fully fledged scientific theory. It is just you know, a, a sketch of a theory or the seed of a theory is an idea. I believe in that idea, but that doesn't mean it is sufficiently rigorous it, that it has been proved. Um, okay, I, I quickly went to modern sciences of life as well. The same thing applies to uh, evolutionary theory. I forgot what existed in my own PDP, uh, uh, PowerPoint slide, PPT, sorry. Okay, thank you for listening. And now we can have questions. And I think Savarish is going to share the, the PDF or the PowerPoint slide so that you can look at the PDF and then ask questions. Uh, so um, this is for like everyone, as Mo said, like we'll be sharing the PowerPoint slide like via mail, like you can just check your inbox. Uh, meanwhile, there are already two questions in the chat. So I think uh -huh. Mo can set up and like later on, we can go on to the other questions. Okay. So can you read so, out the chat? I can't. Uh, Abhinav asks, yeah, yeah, I, I'm reading them. Yeah. Um, Abhinav asks, uh, how is common sense knowledge even useful? if it is allowed this freedom to have logical contradictions and in essence be meaningless? Um, uh, so the answer to that question is, question, you can go, sorry, go. no, let, let me answer that question. The answer to that question is you don't demand perfect knowledge. We deal with uh, whatever is available. If it has some use, we use it. So take, for example, uh, common sense knowledge, uh, let's say my experience in knowledge, I believe that my wife is not going to kill me with a knife tomorrow morning. Can I prove it? No, but I go by that belief. Otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here in her, or you know, sleeping when she's awake. There are many things that we need common sense knowledge for. Most of our daily life goes by common sense knowledge. So for example, take, take something like the belief that I was born in 1947. What's the evidence? And if I, if I behave like an academic to investigate that question, that belief doesn't work. The reason why I believe that is because somebody told me I was born in 1947. I was not present. I mean, I, was, I did not observe my own birth to test it. And my school certificate says that I was born in 1947, but that doesn't mean it is true. Because maybe the, my parents admitted me to the school with the wrong information about you know, my birth. So there are many things of that kind. So common sense knowledge is eminently useful. This is what is interesting. We have to rely on common sense. We have to rely on our experience and observation. All these things are fallible. We have to rely on reasoning, but that does not mean the, that we are infallible. There is no perfect knowledge. We have to go by imperfect knowledge. We have to rely on what is what uh, what contains some degree of unreliability. Obs uh, sensory perception is like that, right? Okay. What's the next question? The Hello? next question, is, yeah, yeah, the next question is from um, Garvit. So he asks. Uh, why do we define species by percentage of common genetic material and not by interbreeding? Uh, the definition that I gave was Ernest Meyer's definition. The definition in terms of uh, genes is a more recent definition. Uh, to engage with that question, I'll take some time. I think that that approach is completely wrong, but I'm not going to defend that, that uh, assertion uh, because I'll just give you a hint. Not all genes are equal. Control genes are much more important than other genes. So uh, just by gene count, shared genes, 
you are not going to get species. You are not going to get anything that is important. If you want to look at structure, if you want to look at evolution, you have to, you have to look at genes which are important genes, which means the selection of important genes, the preserved genes, for example, would be much more important. There are some genes which are preserved all the way from bacteria to humans. Some genes which are preserved from, let's say, all the initial unicellular species, multicellular species to modern humans. Some genes are preserved for all the, all the animals. Some genes which are preserved for all the mammals, all the vertebrates. So we have to look at those things which are preserved and construct an account of uh, uh, trees, evolutionary tree on the basis of those, those genes which are ranked higher than the other genes, not the democracy of genes, not simply the number. Okay, that's just a, a way of looking at uh, evolutionary tree on, in terms of molecular biology. So there's another question from Garud, but before that, just a small announcement. So the PDF has been shared like in the chat box as well. So uh, you can like have a, that would be easy to, easier to access. So um, also, uh, so Garvit asks, could you give an example of the different predictions given by selection and elimination? Okay, uh, elimination is, uh, it, elimination simply says that if an organism, if, if, if a variety, the uh, structure, the function and the behavior of a species doesn't fit the habitat, that will be eliminated. Well, of course, you have to do something more, namely the, the degree of fitness and so on. You have to say uh, some of the crucial functions. So let me take, uh, let me take something like uh, uh, cola bears. Cola bears eat eucalyptus. And so there is a forest of uh, eucalyptus trees, lots and lots of cola bears. And let's assume that uh, only that particular forest on the earth has cola bears and they are thriving in that forest. Something happens and all the eucalyptus trees are cut down. So they were initially there, the cola bears uh, function, the entire thing was fitted perfectly with the habitat of eucalyptus trees. If that habitat disappears, the cola bears will become extinct. That's what the fitness in terms of uh, elimination tells you. It tells you when a species would become extinct. This doesn't require comparison. This doesn't require counting of progeny, nothing. It is just a question of the, the fitness in, of the structure of the function and behavior with the habitat. You don't have to count. The other one says uh, survival of the fittest, which means you take two, two species in the same uh, environment and whichever is more fit would survive. So in other words, I'll be selected. That means the other one will not be selected. So they go out. So it makes a different prediction that if you have two competing species and one is better than the other, the one which is worse will disappear. This is like saying two different ways of selecting students. One says the top, only the top ranker will be selected. Everybody else will fail. That's one criterion. So one student is selected. The other says that if you, if you do not fit a baseline, you will be eliminated. So if you don't get 20%, you will be eliminated, but all the others will remain. One, one requires comparison of two things. The other one doesn't require comparison. Right? That's, those are the two different kinds of predictions. Uh, so I think there's a, an, yet another question from Garvit. So he asks, what if you have a photograph of being born in 1947? So this is in connection with the comment you made about, <laughs> yeah. uh, why should even I if, believe? I was... Even if somebody gives me a photograph and said, this is you when you were born, I have no idea whether it was me or not. I mean, I don't look like that photograph. I can't recognize that child who is infant who is in that photograph. So why should I believe the parents? I mean, I'm not saying that my parents lied about it, but that's a possibility. Uh, but then like, uh, doesn't this kind of uh, uh, like 
transformed into thing like say for example if you are studying for the whole day but your mom doesn't see you studying then you are not studying at all sorry say that again uh, but uh, doesn't this like uh, say if you are studying for the whole day but your mom doesn't see you studying then you are not studying at all yeah so these are things that happen in in uh, in common sense there is no way uh, there is no way for somebody else to check for example i could be looking at a book i'm pretending to be studying and others cannot tell i can say i'm studying well i am you know what happens typically when you're sitting in a lecture how many of you actually listen to the lecture i, I would say about 20% others are doing something else in their head so being there physically is not does not guarantee learning learning happens in the mind sitting there physically and getting attendance doesn't guarantee learning uh then like you say yes i have been learning you have to use other means to test that but mm-hmm. anyway all these are part of the common sense stuff but then like can we conclude that say uh, academic knowledge only like uh, academic knowledge can only be based on uh, observation of something not all forms of academic knowledge mathematics for example is not justified on the basis of observation it is based on axioms and definitions mm-hmm. uh, conceptual inquiry is not based on observation ethical inquiry is not yeah sorry sorry uh, i should have been said like uh, scientific knowledge i would say scientific knowledge yes mm-hmm. scientific okay. knowledge is justified on the basis of observation but again even your observations could be you know faulty mm-hmm. okay oh so that is what you mean when you say that the knowledge is uncertain and fallible yes any any human knowledge is fallible okay but there is nothing that is absolutely true that is the very first principle of academic knowledge okay okay got it thanks yeah. um mo so this is about a question i asked uh, on the chat a while back so like in your uh, axioms like normative axioms for academic knowledge the main axiom is that the all the propositions in that theory should be consistent logically consistent yeah. correct yeah but to find whether two propositions are logically consistent we need to have a logical system right for mathematics it's binary logic classical logic but in general how do you determine like which logic should be used because well so logical consistency is a matter of uh, uh, logical consequence is a matter of the logical system so you mentioned binary logic uh, in the 19th century people developed ternary logic and the the theorems are not the same the 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 derivations which are valid in binary logic are not some not all of them are lo- the valid the the proof is not valid in ternary logic so even classical deductive logic depends upon what you mean by classical deductive logic but the mathematical binary logic can be replaced by mathematical ternary logic it just so happened that that move was not successful we continue using binary logic but there are also other kinds of logics to prove uh to prove uh, observation generalizations for example you use inductive defeasible logic or inductive probabilistic logic that is no, not so like logic. my my question was like on what basis do you decide upon a logical system for a field of study say i am going to study physics so on what basis do i decide upon the logical system that i'll use to by, by looking looking at the arguments and uh, that uh, physicists have made so for example if you look at einstein's argument for the existence of molecules uh for uh for uh, brownian motion you find that the logic he uses is actually what is called uh that's some people call it speculative deductive logic or a version of abductive logic uh, but defi- these are defeasible systems of logic this this is actually a uh a, a fairly extensive question there are different systems of logic that people have proposed there is also a causal logic that is crucial for uh, bio- biology because you know right from the very beginning biology is looking for causal they talk about mechanisms by when they say mechanisms they are talking about causal mechanisms and to evaluate that and also to express uh, a causal theory you need a causal logic and causal logic was developed has been is in the process of being developed it's only as new as let's say 20 25 years it is still not a fully fledged good system and this Sorry, is what happens can i interrupt hmm. i think amog's question was how do you know which logical system to use in a particular context yeah, yeah. by by looking at the uh, looking at the proofs that people are giving the arguments that people are giving 
and unpacking those arguments. So that's why I mentioned, if you look at uh, Einstein's arguments, you will see that they fall into the category of... Uh, but that would be common sense knowledge, right? Like, no, definitely you know, not. Yeah. No? I'm talking about uh, academic knowledge. Yeah, yeah, but like deciding which logical system to use, wouldn't that, like, how do you decide that? That would be common sense knowledge. Wouldn't that be common sense knowledge? Like, once you have a logical system in place, after whatever you do, that can be called academic knowledge based on whatever your arguments were. Ah, okay. Yeah. I, yeah. The, the issue that you're raising is this. What I've, I've described are the actually the epistemic norms that govern academic knowledge. But developing those epistemic norms, you have to move outside of that terrain. You have to use yeah, yeah. Else, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you look at, for example, when you look at engineering, engineering is based on science. So critical thinking and engineering is based on you take science for granted and you examine engineering. But if you're a scientist, you, you take your systems of logic as granted, your, your epistemic systems as granted, your mathematics as given, and then you look, think critically about the science component. Then you move up to mathematics and you take your mathematical uh, system for given, the, the mathematical logic and so on, the epistemology of mathematics as granted, if you doubt that one, you move into the domain of philosophy. So as you move up, ultimately you end up in philosophy and at some point you will not be able to use a formal logic at all. You will have to deal with some uh, less precise way of using natural language reasoning. And so the answer to your question is you do the best you can given the existing circumstances. There is no way of guaranteeing that your conclusions are right, but you you keep struggling. I don't know if that's that answer yes. is satisfactory. Thank you. That's the only answer. There is no there is no uh, formula. There is no algorithm for making these decisions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Garvid uh, is asking another question in the chat. So he asks. Is the theory of reincarnation not an academic knowledge as it is not valuable? Uh, there is no theory as such of reincarnation. There is a, an idea of reincarnation. So, and of course, it may turn out to be, you know, a scientific theory, but right now, no. It doesn't tell me under what conditions I can prove it to be false. So, I can say interesting idea, but... Uh, what do you do with it? Um, then uh, also like uh, are Occam's razor or Henlon's razor, etc. Also, also uh, common sense knowledge because they lack positive ability. Occam's razor is an epistemic norm in, in, in theory construction. It says that given a choice between two theories, the simpler theory is better. That's simply an epistemic norm. And epistemic norms are axioms and axioms cannot be proved. Okay, so we assume uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Also, like, uh, is rigor, you know, like a necessary axiom for academic knowledge? Because rigor is, uh, you know, like, it, is, it depends on the discipline. Really. It's not, so, so math is like mo the most rigorous, maybe uh, biology is not that rigorous, and but still both consider academic knowledge. Yeah, put it this way. If you accept the idea that human knowledge is fallible, including in hard sciences, even in mathematics, and if you also believe that, granted that it is fallible, we must, our responsibility is to get as close to truth as possible, then it, it follows that we must do our best to eliminate error. Mm -hmm. And rigor is a way of eliminating rigor. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It doesn't guarantee truth, but it helps you to minimize error. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Others? Are there any questions? Okay. No. It looks like the questions are over. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. I think so. That's it. Thank you very much.
I enjoyed this. I hope you also enjoyed it, at least the, the people who are still around. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for yeah. giving this talk. Those who wish to view the like recorded version can view it on the YouTube link. It will get saved as a recording there. So you can view it later on if you wish to review or like share it with us.